In part five of Aristotle's Metaphysics, we're looking at the end result, the mature result of his quest to identify primary substances. This is the quest that he began in the categories, continued on through the physics, and now we have the culmination in his work, the metaphysics. Now, I, as I'm talking through this, I am influenced by Michael Lux, that's L-O-U-X, and S. Mark Cohen, uh, both of whom have been influential in my understanding of Aristotle's metaphysics, especially Michael Lux, but certainly I'm borrowing from Cohen as well, although they shouldn't be criticized for any flaws that I have. Those are my own responsibility. So primary substances for Aristotle are essences. These are forms, and forms provide the structure for individual things, and this primarily includes biological entities like plants and other animals and humans. And then in a derivative sense, the forms provide structure for artifacts like a house or a shoe. So we can talk about the form of the horse versus the form of the house. We can compare and contrast these. They are both similar in the sense that the form of the horse gets at the nature of the horse. If you want to know what the nature of the horse is, you have to talk about its form. The same is true of the house. To talk about the nature of the house, you need to know, have an understanding of the form of the house. Now, one of the major ways that these are not the same is that the form of the horse is active. It, as a living entity, it is active in the sense of it causes the horse to grow, it causes it to do the things that horses do, to run, to jump, to eat grass, and so on. It also provides the structure for the horse within itself such that if the horse gets a scratch or a small wound, the form of the horse is what helps the horse heal from those things. This is unlike, unfortunately, houses. When they are damaged, they of course do not self-heal, I would love for mine to be a self-healing house, but that's not the way it works. So there is no form that continues to maintain the structure when we're talking about artifacts. And whatever comes into being, horses, houses, these are produced from something that was existent before it came into being. So we saw this in the physics. So we have both the matter and the universal form existing prior to the individual thing that we're talking about. So the form of the horse, that is the universal form of the horse, existed in the parents of the horse. And here is a rare case where Aristotle was mistaken. He thought that was in the father only, where obviously it's the mother and father are relevant there. Uh, the form of the house existed in the builder of the house, right? The form was, came from the mind of the architect and the, and the builder. And substantial forms then are something unique that we see in the metaphysics. A substantial form cannot exist without matter. Substantial forms are ultimately primary substances. So we saw in the categories, our primary substances were individual things like the person Callius or that particular horse. Well, now what Aristotle is doing is he's being a little more careful here. He's, he's worked through it a little more detailed such that we identify the substantial forms as those essences. These are the usii, the, sorry, brother, the universal forms, of course, are the usii in a derivative sense because it's the substantial forms that exist primarily. So what are these substantial forms? This is the way to think about it. Individual substantial forms are the way that pairs exist. So you have a pairing of individual matter of a particular horse, for example, with a universal form of a horse, and you have that pairing together, 
And that itself is a substantial form. So universal forms, of course, for Aristotle are not entirely independent. They don't exist in some other realm and completely abstract on their own. They're not platonic. And it's not clear, but Aristotle gives a couple hints that their existence might depend on substantial forms existing. Certainly in some places he seems to say that, but there are a couple of couple places in the metaphysics where he hints that maybe their existence depends on the mind of God. And it's the mind of God that has universal forms. And then when they are made with particular matter, we have the substantial forms. So another term for a substantial form, when we're talking about our primary examples, living entities, is a soul. And the soul is the first principle of life. The soul is what makes something a living thing. So if you have a living horse, it has a soul, which is its substantial form. Now, without that, you just have a horse corpse. And so with a, a dead horse for Aristotle is not really a horse, right? It's no longer a horse because it doesn't have that form of the horse that makes something a horse. The substantial form as a soul, it is the formal, efficient, and final cause of activity. So we saw this uh, when we spoke about rabbits in an earlier uh, video, uh, the providing a rabbit uh, jumping over a fence to get to lettuce. It's the nature of the rabbit to jump. It's the nature of the rabbit to eat lettuce. So that's its formal cause, but it's the soul that actually puts it into action, provides the activity, and it's the final cause, the rabbit fulfilling its nature, getting to the lettuce, eating the lettuce, that we could say is the cause of the rabbit jumping over a fence to get to the lettuce. So it all goes back to the soul when we're talking about causes of activities for biological entities. The soul is a substance in that other things are predicated to it, right? being uh, small or fast or able to jump high, but it is not predicated of anything else. It just is. And so this fits in with our guidelines that we constructed in the categories. And the soul is not a kind of a body, but it does exist in a body. So let's clarify this just a little more. What is a soul? Okay, so we have the soul is a substantial form. It is a form that has particular matter related to it. So this is opposed to a universal form that's just an abstract entity that is continued through a species. So a substantial form, the soul, is what makes a thing a kind of thing. It's the substantial form that the horse has that makes that thing a horse, or likewise with an oak tree or a rabbit and so on. So the substantial form, the soul, provides the answer to what is this, right? And a substantial form, I'm going to quote Mark Cohen here, a substantial form is accidental to the matter that it informs, but it is essential to the compound substance, that compound of matter and form, that it is the form of. The the soul is what makes the particular biological entities, like horses, what they are. So what are the qualities or the powers of the soul for Aristotle? Three aspects of the soul. Plato had three aspects of the soul, but they were different than Aristotle's. For Aristotle, we have the nutritive aspect. Now that's included in plants, but as well as every other biological entity. But that's all that plants have, generally speaking. There is sense perception in some animals. Now, not every animal has all of the perception capacities that we have, 
But whatever perception you have, there's a related appetite with it. So that comes with uh, all five of our senses. So we enjoy certain odors and we are repulsed by certain orders, odors. We enjoy certain flavors and we are repulsed by certain flavors. So we have appetites related to every sense perception that we have. And this is true of all animals. And then finally for humans, the rational animal, we have intellect. And the intellectual part of the soul or aspect of the soul is only found in humans. It is the instrument by which the soul thinks. So for a human, we have all three of these aspects. For any other biological entity, an animal that is non-human is going to have the first two, and plants only have the first, that nutritive aspect where they can grow, take in material from the outside environment and make it part of itself, maintain itself and grow just as animals can as well. Now, the more complex levels of the reasoning processes are going to be dependent on the more basic ones. So for humans, that means that our thinking, our reasoning process is going to be dependent on what we could call imagination, not the same imagination that we might typically think of, but our sensations that provide us images of what we perceive. And then those are going to be dependent on nutrition. So our ability to reason depends on our capacity for sense perception. And of course, those, the capacity for sense perception depends on our capacity for nutrition. So ultimately for Aristotle, what are the primary substances, the primary UCIs? These are souls, substantial forms. And this is why hopefully you can see why the, they occur in biological entities, but it really doesn't make sense except in an extended metaphorical way to attribute these forms to artifacts like houses, or file cabinets or things like that.